man I'm going to introduce is actually the man who succeeded an Audi at Torino in the, in the chair. Uh, Francesco Forta is a well-known economist, uh, a, an elected official in the Italian government, a professor in many universities, and an outstanding contributor of, uh, of, of, of in, in economic thought. Ah, mamma mia. Okay, I've got to get back to Professor San Agostino. Well, we've been talking about uh, the, the lineage of different uh, presenters today. Uh, uh, Professor Forta was born, no oh, dog on it. My southern <laughs> charm has escaped me. How do you get this down to the small? <laughs> He's bigger than life, but. something I've done. Excellent, excellent. Uh, it, it's, it's a great honor to introduce Francesco. I've given you a short introduction already. Public prosecutor, uh, the son of, uh, he tells a story about having been stopped by police uh, in, uh, in a rural area with his wife. And they ask him uh, uh, atypically uh, who his father was, and he refused to tell him who his father was. And so they hauled him into the police station, and they interrogated him and uh, held him up and held him up. And finally, uh, he, 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 they ask, you know, why won't you tell us who your father is? And he said, well, I really, I really don't mind. My father is the prosecutor for this region. <laughs> and with that, he was uh, almost immediately uh, uh, found innocent of whatever uh, whatever he had been considered possibly guilty of. But the man is is an absolute icon of uh, Italian public finance theory. He's over 30 books, 300 uh, publications, Italian, English, and international journals, and he writes in English as if he were a native. Uh, he spent a lot of time in the United States uh, beginning in the 1960s, if I have that correct, uh, at the University of Virginia, we're a very close colleague of James Buchanan. He, uh, uh, when Buchanan went to uh, UCLA in 1968 and left very quickly, uh, it was Professor Forta who came behind him and uh, carried the tradition of the Italian public finance theorist to uh, uh, Armin Alchin and Harold Dimsitz and the receptive uh, environment of UCLA. Uh, one of the things that I found interesting about uh, Professor uh, for it, aside from the Virginia School co connection, is that uh, he was uh, a, a, an, an offshoot, a spore, uh, and a, a research assistant, and he wrote his thesis under Benvenuto Agusiadi, who was the father of public finance. Uh, Professor Forta has described uh, uh, Professor Grisiati as having forcefully promoted the study of the Italian public finance school. Uh, the professorial positions are way too many to mention. Uh, in the United States, he's been a fellow at Brookings, uh, UCLA, the International Monetary Fund. He has appointments currently at, at, at University of Rome, La Sapienza, uh, Mediterranean University of Met Reggio Calabria, a law school and economics department at, at, at Sapienza. He's, he's emeritus, but he's not, he's not, how do you say it? He's more active than than, than most people uh, who are uh, still at, at, you know, in the university. Uh, he was, astoundingly, he was vice president of ENI, the major energy company. He's had many uh, committee memberships. Uh, he's very active in the uh, uh, Atlantic. Uh, he's on the board of editors of one of the journals. He's just got too many things to mention. I hope I don't leave anything out. There's some more things I should be saying, but they're on the website. He was a Minister of Finance uh, under Fanfani in 1983. He served uh, in the Italian Senate. He's an absolute icon of public finance. So, with great honor to introduce Professor Forte. Will you help me in this? I'm not the one to have help 
you, I'm afraid. I know. And there's somebody <laughs> else who can do that. Yeah. <laughs> so we got to get out of it. Okay. Just minimize Just a Maybe I learn from watching. There you go. Just minimize the Oh, you move that way. Okay, this is presentation, okay, presentation. No, no, this is... Oh, yes, you're right. Good. Could you make bigger? Yeah, you should. Yeah, 100. Only 100. Okay. Okay, I... <coughs> I am sorry that I have here a presentation which uh, was also <coughs> done for other reasons so maybe too complex, but I will explain it uh, in a few words. Uh, what we do in this uh, paper with Silvia Fideli, which is my successor in my chair at the University of Rome, it is to study in a new way <coughs> the relationship between uh, deficit uh, and unemployment which is normally not done, is deficit and growth. But we thought it is very interesting because the theory of Keynes is a general theory of employment. Secondly, um, we, uh, because I have studied this with a normal type of uh, budget and a normal type of concept of income or GDP, decided that because there is also the cyclically adjusted budget and uh, the, in the European constitution, uh, the, the rule, constitutional uh, European rule of balancing the budget is the cyclically adjusted budget, we now presented, a, uh, we now present a paper in which we show the results that one can get considering the ANEIRU, uh, which is uh, uh, practically no accelerating inflation rate of unemployment, that is, is the level of structural unemployment, or it is the full employment, uh, let us say, in practical meaning in the different countries. Uh, as a dependent variable, and as independent variable, we consider not the deficit to GDP, but the cyclically adjusted deficit to GDP, and the GDP adjusted. So that we have the theory of the balanced budget versus the theory of an unbalanced budget, not from the uh, point of view of a normal behavior, but of the cyclically adjusted behavior. To prove, uh, when we started, we did not know where we were able to do so, that uh, we obtain the same results with the cyclically adjusted budget than we got with the normal budget normal budgetary rule, which is uh, either a balanced budget or an unbalanced budget. Uh, now, what was the result uh, with the non-cyclically adjusted budget? A result that most people didn't like uh, because they are Keynesian or in favor of other reasons, because economists are ne never objective, in my opinion. And so the paper, that paper was criticized, but because the empirical research is the data set, is the uh, official data of uh, OECD for 30 countries for 30 years, it's quite difficult to say that the data set doesn't work. So they criticized the econometric. Uh, in order to be able to show that, that the result doesn't work. Uh, the same happens with this type of paper. For this reason, this, pa uh, type of this paper, as the other, is overloaded with econometrical analysis because all the objections which were given to us were uh, overcome by a new 
test, econometrical test. And so it's rather difficult to present all of them, but any, anyway, this is, uh, this is the, the review of the state of the art. And uh, those are the variable long term and long and uh, short term variable. No, excuse me, go back. Okay, we basically consider the long run, but we also consider the short run because other objections are, ah, but the short run is different. Also, in this case, the result we get it is that high deficit produce high unemployment and high taxes, which of course is combined with high, high deficit maybe, also produce higher unemployment. The same result that we got with the non-cyclically adjusted budget for the long run. However, because they say maybe in the short run policies is different. We also tested the result for the short run and they are more or less similar with uh, some difference. Uh, probably the most interesting difference has to do with the, uh, the variables different from those I, I said. Uh, that are, uh, that we tested, includes, uh, including obviously the level of public expenditure, but also the level of openness uh, of the economy and other variables which I don't describe because were not relevant. The only variable among an enormous amount of variables which logically could be considered relevant, which did appear relevant, it is productivity. In the case of labor productivity, however, uh, there is a, a different result in the long term and in the short term. In the long term, labor productivity uh, at a given uh, level of deficit reduces unemployment. I mean, is, is a, uh, an increase of labor pro productivity is uh, positive from the point of view of a good result. In the short term, uh, well, econometrically speaking, considering all the countries we have, uh, uh, the entire period, is, uh, let us say, irrelevant. I mean, the fact is, that likely in the short term, labor productivity uh, does increase unemployment uh, because uh, if there isn't enough growth in the short term in the depression, uh, there is uh, with uh, an increased labor productivity, the unemployment increases. But in the longer term, the result it is uh, uh, clear, and it is uh, that uh, labor productivity, those are the variables we considered. Uh, okay. Now, what we did also, we considered two aspects. The first very important aspect, theoretically speaking, it is the co-integration. We not only observed in all the paper, but also in this one, that high deficit produces high unemployment, but also the high unemployment produces high deficit. With our co-integration system, there were objections, so we adopted three or four, I don't remember, different methodology of co-integration. Uh, we found uh, this interesting uh, result. The variables are co-integrated. That means 
that an increase of uh, uh, deficit is stimulated also by an increased unemployment. And this is politically very important because it means that there is a kind of, politically speaking, vicious spiral in the sense that the countries that have high unemployment try to combat it with the deficit, and the deficit creates other unemployment and so on. Of course, this result was the most distasteful for the, uh, for the Keynesian or the, 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 I don't know, I mean, the, the people who are in favor of those policies, so that our integration test here were multiplied in order to show that we are right. Another aspect, which however is rather obvious, it is that uh, uh, estimation. Cross-section dependency. Obviously, uh, we have seen papers that show that the monetary union uh, is not really unified. And one could also apply this reasoning to the European Union also for the part outside it. Uh, even more, one can say that about OECD countries as, as, as a, uh, among them. However, uh, one cannot deny that there is a, a big cross-section dependency. It's rather obvious because uh, we, in a sense, have a lot of free trade. And actually, when uh, my colleague was speaking about uh, now the idea of duties, import duty to finance the community, uh, now the import duty don't provide a big revenue because uh, among those countries, uh, the free trade uh, they develop a lot so that there is a lot of cross-section dependency. However, econometrically, this does not damage our research in the sense uh, that we cannot say this is an endogeneity which implies that the variable can no, are not significant. <laughs> this implies another thing, that if many countries have unemployment, and deficit, the effect will be perverse on the other countries in the same way. That is, the cross-sectional dependency is similar, in a sense, to the cointegration. In the sense that also here there is the fact that the less is their employment, the more uh, is the productivity, the more there is uh, reduction of unemployment in the long run in one country, and the more countries are in this situation, the more this situation develops. Uh, on the opposite side, on the opposite side, the more there are deficits, the more unemployment, the more is, uh, the result uh, is uh, negative. So finally, uh, short term, as I said before, in the short term, uh, we observed uh, that labor productivity doesn't work in the same direction. However, I must say that a variable which is absent here, and uh, one cannot see, I mean, we could study this, we did in another paper, is the degree of the flexibility of the labor market uh, because it may be that uh, there is a difference. And actually, for instance, in another paper which is uh, not of this type, is with the normal, with the data not normalized to the cycle, I mean, not adjusted to the cycle, we did observe that the OECD countries 
non-European, have, uh, where the labor flexibility is higher, uh, the problem is lower. And uh, therefore, also, the productivity uh, short run could work in favor of uh, increasing employment, not decreasing or being neutra neutral, uh, if we had more labor flexibility. But of course, this research is not done, and therefore, we cannot tell about this point, which, however, in my opinion, is very important because the other aspect, which is not considered here, because this is an econometric positive study, not a normative study, it is that in many cases, as I have in another paper published in the, in the Atlantic Journal uh, with uh, Magazzino, we show the twin deficit theory, that it is econometrically we demonstrate the deficit in the balance of, of payment is going together with the deficit in the budget. And uh, clearly, if in Europe the policy of restriction uh, of uh, monetary and fiscal restriction is done in order to reduce the balance of payment, unbalance, uh, this uh, would uh, imply that if labor productivity increases uh, and therefore the balance of payment improves, there would be more room for growth. And this bigger gro growth would uh, reduce the deficit GDP ratio, uh, because uh, what, and this is the core, I would say, of the conclusion, we had evidence that also the tax level is quite important in this aspect. So that what is wrong in the European monetary, or no, excuse me, budgetary constitution. They want the balanced budget. However, they don't have put the rule on the level of taxation. So if the budget balance is done cutting expenditure, we have a positive result. If it's done increasing taxation, maybe in the longer run, there is some positive result. But certainly, the level of taxation, that is to increase the level of taxation, has a negative effect on, em on employment. And of course, on growth, because employment and growth uh, clearly are, uh, are, co are co-integrated and correlated. Uh, Therefore, the conclusion of this paper it is, is okay to have uh, the uh, uh, rule of the balance correct for the cycle. Uh, even if I must say that this theory, econometric theory of the correction of, uh, with the cycle is uh, an element of uh, fluidity let us say, or arbitrariness, because just happened that one of our three co-author is an econometrician working for the Ministry of the Budget, and we, not me, I am not an econometrician, but Silvia Fedeli and himself did test the econometrical rule of a cyclic adjusted budget and made an enormous amount of objections. I mean, that the interpretation now, this rule with the existing data, is not so strong. Anyway, this, uh, even taking the fact that uh, what is the theory of a balanced budget over the cycle is dubious, it remains true that this is a very sensible rule because the only objection which was done to Buchanan theory of balanced budget 
or to other theories, it is, but look, in the downward, when the cycle is going up or down, you don't do anything, then you are leaving to the fate this situation. The answer it is, okay, we have a rule of balancing the budget, uh, taking account of the cycle. And uh, this rule leaves out any possible objection about the discussion whether monetary and fiscal policy, there are obviously different points of view, as you have heard, uh, should be done or not. But anyway, we know that with this rule is also possible to do some monetary and fiscal policy. Okay, so this rule is very good, even if there is an element of arbitrariness, as I said in the definition, which however probably is also due to the fact that the rule is new. So the way of uh, defining it uh, econometrically may be dubious, but if we don't change the model in time, the rule is serious, uh, whatever it is. With some approximation, in my methodological theory, the truth doesn't exist. Uh, my idea it is the truth is something pertains to God. Uh, and therefore, to have a perfect model is always impossible, <laughs> and to have a perfect definition also, to have a perfect faithful econometrician is even more uh, impossible <laughs> uh, because I know that there are situations in which one could adjust. I am always against. Sometimes I am criticized because <laughs> I adopt the model of some other people. Uh, if possible, in order to avoid the trick, the econometrician changes a bit, lit, little bit the model, <laughs> and uh, we solve the result as we want. So I know this. But anyway, even admitting all of this is a good rule. What is wrong? It is the fact there is no rule. Two rules are missing. One is demonstrated here. Another, the other in, a, in the other paper where uh, the two kinds of countries are compared. Uh, this paper is already very long, and we will simplify it, but still, the material in it, in it is too much. And the rule the European community has not in it is taxation and labor flexibility. Because obviously, in labor there is a monopoly. Now, a reasoning on competition or market economy with the monopoly of the labor market in different monopolies in different countries is a theory completely different from the theory I am at the end. Now, excuse me if I was too long. Is the, you know, a labor monopoly means simply that the market cannot work. So this should be uh, a rule of the European community, liberalization of the labor market by law. Otherwise, the, there is the De Soto principle, but politically may not take place because, let me say, in Greece may work. May, I don't know. In Spain, could. In Italy, I doubt very much because people still are in a good condition. I mean, it's a bad condition compared with uh, 10 years ago. But 10 years ago, the Italian condition was very good. So, I mean, a little bit of a change doesn't matter. So, the point in which the difficulty of changing uh, in order to improve themselves is broken is uh, very distant in many cases. So if there was an European rule, this is a common market, uh, I tell you, uh, in my opinion, with this kind of study, and uh, 
the level of taxation cannot be uh, above a given level, uh, we would be in a different situation. By the way, I want to end with the witness, which is not here. I had a discussion recently with one of those persons in favor of Europe. Historically, uh, there was a study on which I did work before becoming member of the government for the European Community Affairs, with which was the name was the Common Market, and this is the basis of the Monetary Union. That official document has not been used in the treaty to start the Monetary Union. It was an official document uh, of 300 pages on the so-called great market, liberalization of the market, but they said, no, we go on with the monetary union and this will become uh, later on uh, something that can happen because we want to do this thing. So uh, it's not uh, just happening for intellectual reason, happening for political reason, was it more interesting, more easy to make a monetary union than to have labor flexibility. On taxation, there is another strange idea. In Europe, the only point of view it is to avoid the competitive reduction of taxes. Even the German theory, it is to avoid the competitive. Now, if we, instead of having the rule of no tax competition, we had the rule of tax competition, the, the possibility of going down would be bigger. That means that competition is important also in the labor market and in the tax sector, in a federal union particularly where competition is among the, the government at the various level. Thank you.